my name is Francis Garo. I'm the CEO for one of the few models of care that you find in Ontario, which are part of the community health centers, which is a collection of the alliance of members of uh, CHCs, uh, which does focus on very significant populations across uh, the, the province. Dr. Pinto earlier on spoke about what uh, he learned from uh, uh, Scotland. And I'm gonna share some other concept in there in terms of uh, that model that uh, he described in, um, in, in Scotland is, is already here. And there are some significant headways along the way that uh, we can uh, uh, probably take some recommendations on as we go later on into the conversation. So let me give you a little bit of a perspective of what uh, CHGs are all about. Uh, community health centers uh, have been here since uh, probably the early 70s, precisely 1970s. There's about 73 of these organizations across the province. So I happen to lead one in Durham region and uh, think of it as the south corridor of the 401. The minute you leave Scarborough, you're in Scarborough, all the way as you get to Bowmanville, all those uh, four municipalities that you see along that highway uh, is where the focus of our operation is. Durham as a whole, as you know, it's, uh, it has an attributed population of about 710,000, uh, of which uh, close to about uh, 450 of the 700 are within the South 401 corridor where we serve uh, as a community health center. And the other remainder of the about shortly 200 and change thousand to 300 are in the Northern side of the Durham region, which is predominantly, as you know, in Skugag, in uh, the south, uh, the north end of uh, uh, Durham has Oxbridge, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if I can give you a concept, a little bit of what we do in our organization, you know, think of the 20% of the population of Ontario that uh, faces multiple barriers of accessing care across the province. That's the population that we focus on. And out of that 20% or 22% to some degree, uh, who faces some of these social determinants of health, to just name a few, some of these were named by Dr. Pinto. It includes you know, race, you know, income, housing, their social connections, network in the community, their cultural background, uh, some of their social relationships within the community. That's where we find that 22% who have the barriers or who face the barriers in accessing care. But think about this, of those 20 to 22%, 5% of those are probably the ones that you faced here with quoted with the negative connotations of frequent flyers. And you hear this term you know, in certain parameters because these are folks that will constantly continue to try to access care through some of the emergency departments or walk-in clinics. But if you notice, what are some of the reasons why? We'll get into that in the conversation, hopefully later on in the question period. So in my organization in Keria, if I can give you a little bit of a patient gen mapping that we see, you have a person who walks in as either a new immigrant, uh, they might have a temporary residence or they are actually covered maybe by the federal interim health card. They come for maybe a little uh, ailment that says, well, I am not feeling well. I think I haven't taken my prescriptions for maybe a week, uh, but I can't afford to buy that prescription. I've used a little bit of my income to buy food because I have kids who go to school, etc. So a community health center, our job is to start from where that individual is, you know, starting to ask questions which might lead us to how best we can probably provide the best need for that day. But knowing that from that interaction, we are now able to figure out what does the future visit look like and how do we make sure that we can be as practical as possible. Uh, you know, think of it as Today, when you show up, probably have uh, challenges with your blood pressure, we support you with that. But when we are actually gathering that information, as you are hearing from Dr. Pinto, part of our reason for gathering that data, we are collecting social demographic data that can give us a story of what else is lying underneath the iceberg that can help us understand how best to save you. 
So those elements of collecting that data does not only give us the information that we need today, but how prepared we can be for the future to make sure that we give you the supports that you need. And how best can we make sure that maybe your next visit is not necessarily just the family physician or the NP who is in the practice, but it could be today your best visit is with a dietitian. Now we begin to talk about other elements that could be helpful. Uh, you heard Dr. Newberry earlier talk about uh, some of the challenges that we have could be, you know, the, the things that lead to lower limb amputation, you know, ranges from is that your housing, is that your food, but is that probably some of your lack of mobility to get to certain areas to get the support that you have always needed. So as a, a community health center, we do most of this work and that's our bread and butter. If we were going to do our work very well, our job is investing upstream like you heard from Dr. Pinto. What that means, stopping you from getting sick in the first place by making sure that those elements or those aspects of your life that actually can help deteriorate your health are things that we focus on and invest on you know, immensely to make sure that uh, at least you are in control to as practical as possible to the way of life that you want to, to live. So, you know, when you look further to some of the things that I think you might think of, what would be the best recommendations that we can put on the table today? So let's start by thinking of, it's going to take a long time for the country as a whole to recruit enough physicians to put in every clinic. It's gonna take for, forever. If not at all, this is probably the changing times that we'll actually be trying to think about what should the future look like. So think about integrated models of care that would have an allied health teams that will comprom comprise all these uh, disciplines that we are talking about, you know, in terms of NP, RNs, dietitians, OTs, that are working collectively under one roof where that can be one-stop shop. What you want to see in those environments which is happening within CHC, a provider, a physician or an NP can walk across the room talking to a mental health specialist, talking to a dietitian, and also talking maybe to an outreach worker who would be uh, some of the, you know, we call them eye, eyes on the ground, who will be connecting the services that an individual needs within their home. And these models of care and support are far much effective, cheaper, efficient within the communities that we have. And they actually can help in preventing people from getting sick. An example of what we are seeing with some of this work, again, Another minor recommendation that you have already been reading about out there. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, uh, and the Institute of Canadian Institute of Social Prescribing. That work of uh, social prescribing is work that was given birth uh, within CHC's environment. And it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's the work that has helped CHC's, as you know, take care of most of the complex patients that end up at the front door of the communities that we serve. Think of all those uh, complex conditions that include COPD, uh, CHF, uh, chronic mental health conditions, but also uh, things that we cover under geriatric intervention when we deal with uh, seniors that are at the early stages of dementia. The social prescribing are part of the key pillars that help identify and address some of the barriers that we actually talk about when we talk about social determinants of health. And they have significant health outcomes that are positive that you can see from day one to say week seven of an individual being integrated in those services, you can gradually see improvements that give independence and uh, you know, longevity to individuals staying in their homes, but also a degree of independence within the supports that they have to be able to continue to enjoy their independence within their home. Uh, one other thing that I will add also in uh, some of these recommendations, I know for most of you who might not be familiar with CHCs, when you have an opportunity to research, you know, I want you to take some time to look at what exactly is offered within your areas. One of the key pieces that I'll put up front is within the CHCs, there are multiple programs that are uh, delivered that you do not have to be rostered 
to SCHC for you as a provider, as a physician, as an NP, as a specialist, to have your clients or your patients access those services. They are services that are open to the community. An example in my community here where I have, I have what, a, what is called an IPC, an interprofessional team, that is uh, you know, the most responsible lead in there is an NP. So what they do, they're focusing on these special specialty supports to an entire community of physicians that refer to them. As a physician next door, solo, you can say, hey, I'm sending my patient here who is uh, probably type one diabetes or with mental health and they're schizophrenic or they have bipolar, uh, can you support them? They'll be able to be supported through that team and the notes will be sent to you as the provider, a primary care provider physician for that individual. Laterally, these teams, they become an extension of your office and you'll be able to take an opportunity uh, to engage with them as frequent as possible. So the recommendation with that is you end up as a system having to save significant amount of, uh, amount of money by investing in these integrated teams that allow you to really have eyes on the ground and interventions that are able to prevent people to get to, uh, to the ED for those visits that are not necessarily suited for the ED. If you look at the measures that will come out of there, there's uh, probably a number of them, but a couple of them that I'll give you that you probably will look back and say, this makes sense, is when we collect social determinants of, uh, of health, you know, right at that point of collection of the information, we already know by the time you get to the second visit, what other care supports that could be lined up for you that could be able to help you prevent you from making, say, another visit, but also connecting you with some of the supports that include, you know, housing, that also include food security, that may also include maybe a prescription being helped to be filled for you that you cannot afford.